Now, I will describe the Stengerla experiment in a, a sketchy. Of course, the actual drawing is, you can see, in, a, in a, any introductory quantum mechanics books. I will uh, plot a sketchy figure now. Here, perhaps this profile may be needed. Let me try to... Actually, the actual profile of the magnet is quite precise, but the, this is symbolic. I don't mean to say that my artwork is beautiful. It's not. Suppose we have this tip so that most of the magnetic field lines uh, they, uh, converge towards that tip. So this profile sort of guarantees that the magnetic field going from north to south has that shape. If we take this to be the z-direction, and for example, this could be the y, and this could be the x here. Y is this way, inside. Z is that direction. Well, this particular form of the B is to give it a space gradient. You'll see the reason why B need a space gradient. This is from uh, the perspective of seeing the profile. Actually, uh, the entire gadget can be viewed differently in a, a, in a, in a more sketch manner. Anyway, here is the, there is an oven in here, and in this oven uh, they're uh, heating the silver atoms. There are silver atoms in here. Silver atom has the atomic number 47, and that many uh, neutrons uh, as well, so the atomic weight is different. So this there is a collimator in the front here, and there is a, a, they come out of that oven, and they go through this Stengerlatt gadgetry. Let's plot it this way, and then they split. This picture, details of this picture is not important because my point is not to give you an artwork, but to tell you the basic principles of how is it happening. First of all, they use, they use those gentlemen in, uh, as, all, as early as 1921 and 22, almost 100 years ago, they use these silver atoms. Nowadays, some people are using potassium as well and other atoms, and depending on their chemical structures and chemical inertness, etc. Our, purpose, our main purpose is not that, to give you the chemical information. But what is the atomic structure of the uh, silver? Let me explain this previously, based on your previous information, your previous education of the atomic structure. Because in this class, or the, f the further 508, <coughs> It's not part of the repertoire that we talk about atomic physics. That much is supposedly be learned in the previous classes. So it is not logically inconsistent that I use a little bit of quantum information to analyze the silver atom structure and to tell you why that can be used for that purpose. It's a neutral atom, not ionized. That's important. This atom, neutral. Because if you ionize it, that's totally different. Uh, uh, property. Let's take a hydrogen-like atom. Hydrogen-like atom, we know that uh, there are uh, for each, uh, first of all, it can be represented 
by a, a wave function like this. This is previous information. As I said, I, I apologize for using old version, old notation to describe that gadgetry. N is the principal quantum number, L is the orbital angular momentum, M is the magnetic quantum number, so-called. And N runs from 1 to anything, L runs from 0 to N minus 1, and M is accordingly bounded from below and above by the L, and L minus L. Why this is important, energy is alpha squared divided by 2n squared mc squared, or if it is hydrogen-like, you have to put in the z. So perhaps the detail is not important, because let me not get into detail. Energy is labeled by n, the principal quantum number, but the wave function is labeled by nlm. Therefore, if you count the degeneracy, there is n squared degeneracy. For each n, there are n squared many wave functions describing corresponding to this level. But actually, if you include the spin, there is 2s plus 1, so there is a factor of 2 coming from the spin, so degeneracy is 2n squared. Well, that is important for constructing the architecture of the atom, starting from hydrogen-like atoms. That is, you have Z, many protons at the nucleus, you ionize everything, you start packing in the electrons, as if you pack and electrons into a one-dimensional box to, co to all the way to the Fermi level. So that is a beautiful mechanism, really. How do you do that? If n is, n is equal to 1, so uh, the degeneracy is 2 times 1 squared 2. So there are two places for the electrons. For n equals 2, 2 times 2 squared, 4, 8. n equals 3. 2, 3 squared, 9, 18. But let's analyze, uh, go to the substructure of those shell structure, or so-called orbitals of the atomic physics. If n equals 1, l equals 0, so it's really, that's it. n equals 1 has these two, two electrons only. Here. For n equals 2, you have a possible value of L is 0 and 1. So this one, uh, what is the, then, uh, the total spin? Total spin, uh, total angular momentum is L minus a half, L plus a half. It is 1 half. For L equals 1, total spin is 1 half and 3 halves. So there are actually two j plus one, two electrons. There is a room for two electrons in here. And there is a room for two electrons in here. And there is a room for uh, f four electrons in here. So altogether, six. So two plus six is eight. You, you see, that's how you can place that many electrons to form a closed shell. Let's take the one-dimensional box again. One-dimensional box energy is proportional to n squared, right? One, two, three. At the, you start if to construct a ground state of electronic system. You put that spin up and spin down in the n equals one, and spin up and spin down in n equals two, spin up and down n equals two. What do I doing is that? What am I doing is that here, spin up, spin down, spin is zero. Spin up, spin down, spin is zero. If there is an unpaired electron at the topmost level, which is the Fermi level, that is the net spin of this box, really. Here. So if you go through the uh, system, what is the then? Uh, this is the detail, and I'm not going to go through the detail anymore. So n equals 4 is twice 4 squared. That is 16 and 32. Let's see how do I go. We go to the, the, way, the way we proceed is the following, to construct the silver. 2 plus 8 in the n equals 2, and plus 18 at the n equals 3, plus 
32 at the n equals 4. 10, 28. If you add that, that's 50, 60, that's too much. So there's part, some of the shells are um, uh, uh, not fully uh, closed. That some of, there are empty shells in here. How are they? Let me analyze this n equals 4 case. L equals 0, 1, 2, 3. L equals 0 is j equals 1 half, there are 2. j equals 1, you have 2 plus 4. j equals uh, 2, there is 3 half plus 5 halves, 4 plus 6. There is the j equals 3. 3 minus 1 half is... Six, five by two, six plus seven by two, eight. So this is how the, the, the these are the number of places for to form closed shells. There is two. What is the missing in here? Ten, twenty-eight, minus twenty forty-seven. How many I need? Nineteen, right? 19 is composed of 18 plus 1. That's good. 2, 6 makes it 8. 10 makes it 18. So the, this one is essentially empty because there is only one electron sitting in there. All those Shells are closed. So uh, spin-wise, they're zero. The, the entire atom, except the outmost electron, which is one, contains 46 altogether now, because 47 is 46 plus one. All these are closed shells. And this one is the outmost electron. All the closed shells, if you neglect the nuclear spin, you have to really convince yourself why you have to neglect the nuclear spin. Then the net spin of the atom, except the outermost electron is zero. Outermost electron is a single electron, carries spin one half. So the silver atom, neutral, you need to have that outermost electron. If it is not, it's neutral, it doesn't carry any spin. You cannot it cannot behave like a magnetic moment or it cannot behave like a spin. So this is a neutral atom because of this extra electron, it behaves like a spin one half object. So what happens then if it behaves like a spin one object? By the way, this is a very heavy, this is a very heavy stuff. And if you carry out an uncertainty analysis, which I may assign as a homework or sometimes you'll face it, then when the mass is large, the uncertainties, which sort of spoils the picture, this nice splitting, if the mass is large, the uncertainty is very small. If the mass is small, the uncertainty is big. So you need heavy, heavy stuff. And these gentlemen were obviously very bright people. Huh? They used uh, silver, which is, if there is 47 protons in the nucleus, there is at least that much neutrons. So this is a very heavy object, 10, 2 times, 10 to the 5 times as massive as the electron itself. Why that argument is important? Because notice that I have used a semi-classical picture in here in discussing a quantum mechanical problem. At first it may sound inconsistent because I plotted trajectories. And in quantum mechanics there are no trajectories. There are expectation values and distributions, right? Therefore, it is heavy. The silver atom is heavy, so it wouldn't be too wrong in the context of uncertain type of arguments to think of the trajectories and splitting trajectories and leaving traces in here. So if you look at the, the traces from this side, you look at it and it, you see something like this. instead of the full, full trace in the photographic plate. <clears throat> so
So that's Stengerla. This silver atom, neutral, heated, hot, hot atoms, and it's collimated, sent through this gadgetry, and it's siplet. Let me explain why it is siplet. In the first place, that is again a semi-classical argument. And of, of course, we could borrow from the quantum mechanics and make it more rigorous, but we don't really need this. This semi-classical argument is sa safe enough because of the fact that it's a quite a heavy object. If you were using a single electron, and or, or there would be uncertain fluctuations that would really spoil the picture. A proton is 2,000 times heavier than electron. Proton is slightly heavy. So if you have this 47 protons and about 50 neutrons, altogether about 100 nucleons. 100 nucleons are 200,000 times heavier than an electron. You see, it is really a fluffy, heavy object that you are sending through. Therefore, that explains why you have trajectories and why you can use the semi-classical argument. What is the semi-classical argument? So what is the energy, additional energy or interaction energy of the neutral silver atoms going through here? That picture is that or there. And there is an interaction energy minus mu dot b. Mu is the magnetic moment, b is the uh, field. It's because of this, the, this special topology of the geometry, you know, the geometry of the magnets, there is a space dependence. And b is not homogeneous along the b. It is getting more dense, therefore it depends on the z. It depends on the x's and y's, and that is to be taken into account in the computations, but that people carry it over, that's no problem. This is the energy, and what is the force? This is the semi-classical argument that I'm writing, and I will uh, justify this. Notice that the, I'm using force, I'm using potential energy, and this is a concert system, and for force is the minus the gradient of the potential energy. If you're not very happy with this, you may say, use the e quantum mechanical arguments what is the d by dt of the p expectation value? Well, it is the i over h bar times the expectation value of the commutator with the p. Well, that's perfectly right. That's, what is it? That's RFS theorem. Expectation values obey those quantum mechanical rules. So you may have the expectation value version of this equation, but as this, uh, the uh, atom is so heavy, 2 times the 10 to the 5, times heavy than the electron. So this semi-classical argument makes perfect sense. So let me proceed with this semi-classical argument. This is the force. So if you write this in, minus and minus is plus mu dot b is the force it's going to be subject to when it's going through this. Which direction, which, what is the direction of the force? Let's analyze it. Mu is the magnetic moment. What is, how is the magnetic moment of a spin carrying object depend on the spin? It is minus, if it is, well, it is the electron at the outermost shell, which gives you that magnetic moment. Therefore, sine is due to the fact that E, this is a, a universal positive number. You put a minus on it to denote an electron. If it was a proton, I would be putting a plus in the front. Minus E divided by 2mc times the g times s. g is the gyromagnetic ratio, and that is how the spin and magnetic moment are related. That is the difference from quantum mechanics to classical mechanics. Because in the classical mechanics, that's q divided by 2mc times the orbital angular momentum generation of the magnetic moment. How do you do that? You use that semi-classical argument. Take a loop. And uh, suppose that you have a charge Q with mass m going around the loop. And what is the angular momentum? R cross mb. 
that's an expression. What is the magnetic moment? Magnetic moment can be also easily expressed using the argument that the current going through this is Q times I, and you equate the both sides and you get the Q divided by 2MC. But in quantum mechanics, as these are really intrinsically quantum mechanical, there is something called the gyromagnetic ratio, and if an electron is almost point-like, almost 10th to 9th digital place, it is 2. It is 2 exactly in the Dirac equation relative to quantum mechanics. It is 2 experimental, 2.0001, something like that. So that 2 cancels the 2, so you have minus E over MC S. Therefore, when you put those quantities in, the force becomes E over, there is again a minus, E over MC S divided by, okay, I have to use now a notation, which I have to refer to the index notations to make it safe. Fi, Sj, Di, Bj. Notice that repeated indices are summed over. That takes care of the dot product of the S with B. And Di is the gradient, the same, the index as carried by the force. Okay, if I take the B, the dominant B is in the Z direction, so that's going to be SC. And that will be DIBZ of, well, Z and other variables. We take the gradient, because of this geometry of the magnets, the, uh, the main dependence of the magnet is in the z direction. The other sides, they compensate each other, the forces, etc. So I don't take that into account. The z component of the force then is Fc is minus E over MC SC D B Z Z Z. If it was classical, what do I what would I have in the oven when you heat the silver? Then, uh, as if the temperature is high, the magnetic moments, they still carry magnetic moment because of the outmost electron, but all these magnetic moments would be randomly distributed. You, you remember it from your thermodynamic classes. When you have a high temperature, they are randomly oriented. They can orient any, any direction they, 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 they want. So, when they come out, they go, through this gradiented, that's the profile, magnetic field, there's a force up if S is minus, there is a force down if S is, there is a force up if S is minus, and if it is up, there is a force down. And this is well known. If it is continuous, then you would have this entire thing filled in that would be the trace you would be seeing coming out of there. But you just have that trace and that trace. Meaning that there are two projections, two components. Part of the atoms are aligned along the B magnetic field and part of it half and half in the down because it, if they are randomly oriented Half of them are oriented along the up, half of them al uh, uh, aligned along the down direction. You may say, what? Is there anything special about this Z direction? No. What is revealed in this experiment is that if you d take any direction, reference direction, when you try to measure the spin in any direction, you, you will get either it's fully aligned up direction or fully aligned down direction. 
That is the so-called, in using the old terminology, so-called space quantization, quantization of the spin. So this reflects, these two traces they have seen reflects the fact that spin has two orientations, two components. Along any direction, it, they will either align in the parallel direction or anti-align in the anti-parallel direction. So that's why they, some people call it as the greatest discovery, which is purely intrinsically quantum mechanical in nature. Okay. Well, so that is the Stangerla experiment, the discovery of the spin. Eventually, uh, uh, Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith, in a f couple of years later, they developed the spin formalism. So this experimental discovery came first and the actual theoretical formalism developed later and with some help and in, uh, additional inputs from the Pauli, it was fully understood. So it fits into the same period, 1925 and 26. But that's the synthesis and comple complete synthesis of the quantum theory, including the understanding of the electron's nature. So how, well, how do we use this to illustrate the previous example that I mentioned? So you understand what is the Stengerlach gadget is all about, how it functions sketchily. I'm not, if you want to read a little bit of detail, there are plenty of beautiful books and uh, internet resources. Just read through. And modern physics books also contain some nice discussion about it. Our point is that it discovers that spin has uh, two states, up and down, and how do we use that gadgetry as a, a, a tool for setting the foundation of quantum theory, which I mentioned before, without referring to any uh, experiment like this. That the concept of state has changed from a, a collection of po position and momenta to a state vector description. And the <coughs> Dynamical variables are replaced by operator order dependent entities. And let's use this uh, experiment for those illustrations. Okay, how do we proceed? He has those nice settings. Okay, let me use consecutive, consecutive Stengerla experiment gadgets and let's form some experiments. Stengerla to uh, experiment as a measuring tool for spin. It's not, isn't that amazing? So we have a now a, a measurement tool. Notice that as we are in the micro world, we have to develop special, special, special tools for measurement. For example, you need accelerators to measure short distances in the atomic structure, stuff like that. They are the micro, sort of new microscope. This may be also taken as a new measuring tool. What do I mean? If we use two Stengerla in a sequence, if I put that Z or X or Y, it means the magnetic field is in the, the gradiented magnetic field is in the z direction. So it creates a splitting in the z direction. That's the symbol, meaning of symbol. Now we, from the oven, we take a beam, whatever they are, a beam of particles, we send it through the first Stengerla gadget. And then what do we get? as they are randomly oriented, we get two beams. One is the plus, well, he is using a very heavy language, which is tiresome. Let me try to use um, 
a shorthand plus c no, but i i don't want to borrow from the future so plus z meaning spin ups and spin downs that's a representation symbolic representation of the status of the objects in the upper beam and lower beam in principle as initial uh, this comes from the oven they are randomly distributed in the hot oven when they come out they they are sent through this uh, this uh, stangerla z gadget that's magnetic field is gradient in the z direction it's simplest to beam in the z direction half of it go through with the spin up half of it go through with the spin down but the nice thing about this gadgetry uh, for the setting of the foundation you block say the lower one so you don't let any of those but it's easy to to to, to arrange this setup you block the spin down beam and you let only the spin up beam go through again go through the uh, again z type of stanger like gadget that is magnet is in the z direction what you see is nothing here so it you get a z beam out if you repeat this put another z gadget you get a plus beam a plus beam a plus beam remember i said if you um, prepare the system and make a measurement on the q variable so you got a q1 result repeat the same measurement you get still the q1 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 here out of there are two possible results either spin up or spin down I had obtained a spin up and spin down, blocked the lower half. And so what is reaching in the second gadget is a spin up. If I pass it through the, again, Z gadget, the initial one was spin up, it will go through a spin up. No spin down. So that verifies. This is what is observed. Eh? But I'm describing you the results of experiment carried out in consecutive Stengerla tools. Than Gerla equipments. Now the second setup. Let me finish this in the remaining minutes. Now we put a X type of Stengerla as in the second step. Okay, this is a, another experiment. I have a Z type of Stengerla gadget. This is coming from the oven. So this is the randomly distributed one. So it is again polarized. Well, half of the beam is polarized in the z direction, and half of the beam is polarized in the minus direction. We again block the down polarized beam. We have the up polarized one reaching. Now, this time I am putting here a x type of Stengerla gadget. What do you get? What is obtained is up polarized in the x direction and down polarized in the x direction. QP pair, remember my abstract example? So this gives you results of the spin along the x directions. Originally, I had a, a Z polarized beam that is uh, beam polarized in the Z direction. Now here they are polarized in the half is polarized in the X direction up, half is polarized in the X direction down. And interesting, but that's what happens. To make it more interesting, let's do the following. Let's do add a third one. This is this will be same as before. Let me redraw it because they are so important. I cannot afford to use shorthand for this. This is the same as before. I have the plus Z polarized beam reaching here SGX. This is the SGZ originally. That's coming from the oven. 
a mixture of randomly polarized stuff. This lower one is blocked, minus Z is blocked. So I have a purely Z polarized beam reaching the X type of gadget. Then what is coming out again? Plus X as before, minus X as before, but we block this and I have here an X polarized beam and I pass it through a, another Stengerda, which is the Z type of Stengerda. What is expected? If you were naive, <coughs> originally this carried a plus Z polarization and furthermore this added a plus X polarization. So what is expected here is, uh, on the naively I would expect to have a plus Z only because it, if it carried, if it had a memory of the past, if the me past memory is not lost or ruined, I knew that there was a plus Z in here. And so this is the Z type and this was a X polarization that would be lost and I would get a plus Z. But what we get is equal amount of plus and minus Z. That's beautiful, isn't it? So whenever you carry out a measurement, the last measurement forces you to settle in the relevant states associated with this measuring device. If you are measuring the Z component of the spin, it is the Z states enter. We are going to call them, we are going to identify as the eigenstates of the SC operator. So this is really amazing. This naive interpretation that it would carry this information over and that information over and you would get plus C is obviously totally wrong. That's the classical concept and it doesn't carry through the quantum region. Well, the book, I'm not 100% sure that that's a good analogy. Let me explain before moving into that subject and we may take it up next week. Either we may proceed following him carefully or we may have a better argument pro produced at the time. He wants to make sense out of it and uh, draw results. Concerning the definition of state in the context of quantum theory, how I have described them in an abstract manner before, but in this context, how, we do, how we, do we define a spin state? That's one thing. And what are the spin components, X, SX, and SY, and SC, what are they? How do we measure them? And are they the same as numbers as before in the classical context? Or do we have to assign them new meaning, and like operators I mentioned before, order dependent entities. The example he's referring to is the polarization of light, taken in the context of classical optics. He says, let's take polarized, let me use the terminology he's using, Polaroid, Polaroid filters. We all know what Polaroid filters are because of the glasses, right? Sunglasses we are having. And it is uh, used, used as a protection against the sun directly coming in, so, sort of using, I guess, parallel horizontal, horizontal filters so that it doesn't come to your eyes directly. So either you can have vertical po polarizing Polaroids or horizontal Polaroids. And then if you have a, a light source, put in front of it. This is a very sketchy thing. I will do it quickly. Perhaps I will return it later. If it is a vertical Polaroid, this is the original light, which is unpolarized. And this light is, of course, then vertically polarized. If you put in front of it a horizontal Polaroid, Polaroid 
This wouldn't let it pass and there will be no light coming out. Or you can put them in a different order. You can have a parallel Polaroid, uh, then you, you polarize them in a parallel manner and then put the other one in front and there is no light coming out. And then he writes the electric field as the main agent of the light. Electric field oscillates like sinusoidal, right? Cosine or sine, whichever you use. And there is the direction of polarization. And then he says, let's establish an analogy between this one and the Z type of, associate this Z type of the Stengerla with the vertical polarite and the X type with the horizontal polarite and try to understand this quantum mechanical, because that's spin. It's quantum mechanical events, set of events in the context of classical description of light in terms of their polarizations using a Polaroid. One thing which doesn't make me happy about this discussion is that you are using to explain a new phenomenon by referring to an old classical phenomenon, but we don't know that much really. I, at least I haven't discussed the full details of the polarization of light in the context of classical optics. But anyway, perhaps you have taken optics classes before, perhaps you have not. If you haven't taken any optics cl classes and if you don't really know that much about the polarization, however classical it is, then of course this analogy wouldn't help you that much in understanding. I could shortcut that analogy and directly jump into the formalism of saying that the states are described by the elements of a linear Hilbert space and the dimension of the Hilbert space depends on the possible alternatives that you, you may have in an experiment like this. What are the alternatives? Two parts, so two alternatives, two dimensional Hilbert space. If it was a spin one instead of silver, if, if I used another thing, which would have three, three beam splitting, then I would have a three-dimensional Hilbert space, et cetera, et cetera. So I will decide till next time which avenue we, are, we, are, we will be following. We have a very much quite a good level of understanding we have achieved through the help of Stangerla. I think I can jump into sort of pure mathematical discussion to construct the Hilbert space starting next week. So that's it for today.